In today's world, computers are everywhere. These amazing machines enable us to accomplish an incredible variety of tasks. Much like modern day Michelangelo's, graphic artists use computers and sophisticated graphic software to create beautiful designs on an electronic canvas. Many branches of the medical profession use computers. This surgeon is using a computer along with specialized software he designed to test his patient's hearing. Office professionals, like this administrative coordinator, use computer software programs every day. Spreadsheet programs help her track department finances. This airborne express driver is using a handheld scanner to read the barcodes on packages. The information is fed into a computer which tracks the package's progress through shipment. Architects use sophisticated computer-aided design and 3D software packages to create building plans. Finally, who can forget the fun computers have brought into our lives? Games like this one provide hours of entertainment. Hello, I'm Sheila Swanson. Welcome to the Career Track Learn PC training series, Computer Literacy 101. I'll be your host for this course. Computers are everywhere. Graphic artists, office workers, medical professionals, architects, these are just a few of the people who are using computers to work more productively. You too can take advantage of the power offered by computers. This course will help you in three ways. First, you may be thinking about purchasing a computer for your home or business. If so, you'll need a basic knowledge of their operation and the many options available to you. Second, you will need to learn about computers for your job or education. This course will provide a valuable introduction. If you're looking for a job, a glance at the employment ads will show you that a working knowledge of computers is essential for getting many interesting, well-paying jobs. Estimates are that in less than 10 years, two out of three jobs will involve working with computers. If you're a student, using word processing software will make writing reports faster. Automatic spelling and grammar checkers will make your reports more accurate. Third, even if you never use a computer, you will talk to many people who do. This course will help you become computer literate. That's what this course is all about, helping you understand and control the power of computers by giving you an introduction to basic computer concepts and terminology. We've divided computer literacy into two parts. In part one, we'll give you a general introduction to computers. In part two, we'll discuss computer hardware and software in more detail. In part one, you'll learn what a computer is, how a computer works, how today's computers evolved, what important developments are occurring in work, education, and home computer use, what responsibilities you have as a computer user, what we mean by computer hardware, what we mean by computer software, what the computer processor is, and the kinds of input devices you may use. We need to begin by answering the question, what is a computer? Computers are complicated machines, but in general, they're tools to help you work. Simply put, three things happen inside a computer. Information moves in, that's called input. Information is changed, that's called processing. And information is moved out, that's called output. We can compare the operation of a computer to a food processor. You put food in, that's input. You process the food, that is, slice, dice, grate, or grind it. And you take the processed food out, that's output. Of course, a computer processes information, not food. But the procedure is similar. Let's look at how input, processing, and output all work together in a simple computer system. The system has three main parts. A keyboard where you input information. The information flows inside this box to an area called the CPU or Central Processing Unit. Here information is changed, rearranged, or calculated. The monitor outputs or displays the information. The keyboard, central processing unit, and monitor are the main parts of every computer. However, most computers have other specialized equipment. The mouse is a popular piece of equipment that is being used increasingly with newer software programs. You can use a mouse to input information into the computer. The mouse sits on the desktop, often on a special pad. Guided by your hand, the mouse moves a small arrow called the pointer around on the computer screen. You can use a mouse to select items from a menu or create graphic images. A mouse provides a simple alternative to using the keyboard for many common tasks. A scanner is another common piece of equipment for inputting information. 
There are two basic types of scanners, image scanners and optical character recognition, or OCR scanners. Image scanners are used to scan photographs and other pictures into documents. Barcode scanners are used at checkout counters with computerized cash registers to total the cost of items purchased and update inventories automatically. There are other kinds of equipment called devices you can use for inputting information into a computer. There are also output devices like this printer that a computer can use to print information it has processed. There's one more important computer concept we need to mention. That's information storage. One reason computers are so valuable is they can store huge amounts of information. Computers can store millions of pieces of information, pages of text, graphs, artwork, almost any kind of information you can imagine. Information can be stored on a hard disk. A hard disk drive is usually built into the computer. Information can also be stored on a removable diskette. Both are permanent forms of information storage. Information stored on a hard disk drive or on a diskette can be retrieved quickly or input back into the central processing unit for processing. Combining the capacity to store information with the computer's abilities to input, process, and output information greatly multiplies the computer's power and usefulness. If you're creating a document, the ability to store information saves a tremendous amount of retyping. You can retrieve a report created earlier, make changes, and print a copy when you're satisfied with it. In effect, the computer will retype the report for you. Storage devices also let you access software programs. These are the instructions that tell your computer how to perform jobs. All computers input, process, output, and store information. In fact, as we look at the history of computers, you'll see these basics have remained the same throughout the years. What has changed is that the size and price of computers have decreased dramatically. At the same time, the amount of information computers can handle and the speed at which they can work have increased dramatically. In the 1890s, an American named Herman Hollerith invented a computing machine to tabulate United States Census Bureau results faster and easier. Hollerith's system of punched cards was used to input information into his new tabulating machine. This machine was a forerunner of later electronic computers. The first of these computers was developed for military purposes during World War II. The ENIAC was the most famous. The ENIAC was huge, weighing more than 30 tons and using enough electricity to light a small town. The ENIAC could perform about 5,000 additions per second, making it the fastest computing machine ever. However, each calculation required days to set up, involving thousands of switches, dials, and cables. In the early 1960s, the introduction of transistors led to computers that could do the same processing work as ENIAC, but much faster. Later, integrated circuits allowed even faster processing. The first computer to use both integrated circuits and transistors was known as a mainframe computer. Mainframes were very fast, but early mainframe computers were still so big and expensive, only large corporations, universities, and the government could afford them. But this began to change. In the 1970s, the Intel Corporation introduced a new kind of integrated circuit called the microprocessor. The invention of the microprocessor made microcomputers possible. In 1981, IBM introduced its own microcomputer, also called a personal computer, or PC. In today's computing environment, when we talk about computers, there are actually four classes of machines. Supercomputers, mainframe computers, minicomputers, and microcomputers. These machines differ in their processing speed and amount of disk storage space. As the name implies, supercomputers are the fastest, most powerful machines. They're often used for scientific purposes and engineering simulations. Mainframe computers can be used by many people working at terminals or microcomputers linked to the mainframe computer. Many computers are powerful enough for a small business or a department. They're usually used by four or more people. Finally, microcomputers or personal computers are designed to be used by one person at a time. This course will focus on personal computers. One critically important development in computing is the increasing use of personal computers in education. From grade school, where young children are introduced to personal computers as a lifelong learning tool, 
to graduate school, where adult students use sophisticated programs to analyze information. Personal computers are everywhere in education. In between, students learn word processing to write reports faster and use all kinds of software programs to learn mathematics, language arts, and science. Some instructors design lessons for their students using an exciting new technology called interactive multimedia training. These lessons let students use powerful personal computers to interact with a combination of text, graphics, videotape, audiotape, and animation appearing on the screen. Research shows students learn more in a shorter time and remember what they've learned longer with interactive multimedia training programs. Another important development is the popularity of home computing. People use personal computers to maintain financial and property records, write letters, prepare income taxes, take classes, and play games. Many people subscribe to commercial information services that let them pay bills and bank by computer. Subscribers also shop from home, make airline reservations, use online encyclopedias, and get electronic mail, up-to-the-minute stock market quotations, and sports information. Whether you use a personal computer at work, school, or home, these important developments will make life easier. However, along with the tremendous power computers offer, come some responsibilities. Important responsibilities that affect every computer user are only using software programs you're authorized to use, safeguarding the personal information of others, and protecting software programs and information from computer viruses. Computer software programs are protected by copyright laws, just as books and movies. Anyone who copies or uses a program without permission, which usually involves payment, is stealing. Companies spend huge amounts of time and money creating programs. People who use software programs without permission are hurting others by depriving companies of revenues needed to pay employees. Individuals or companies using programs without permission can be sued. On the other hand, people who are authorized program users receive helpful manuals, hotline numbers to call for answers to questions, and updated programs. Another responsibility users have is safeguarding personal information. Today, businesses and medical offices store all kinds of information on computer. Employment histories, financial records, and health histories are there for anyone who knows how to retrieve them. If you work with personal information, remember other people's right to privacy. Don't leave sensitive documents on your desktop or computer screen where anyone can view them. Safeguard passwords and other access codes, as well as diskettes containing sensitive information. Finally, all of us need to guard against computer viruses which can destroy software programs and information. A virus is a software program that infects other programs. While some viruses are harmless, others can destroy expensive software programs and valuable information. Computer viruses can be spread through electronic bulletin boards used to exchange software and information through sharing infected computer diskettes and through viruses that have been placed on computer networks. You can protect your computer and the information stored in it. You just need to follow a few simple rules. Never use unfamiliar diskettes unless they've been checked out for a virus. Don't lend your diskettes to others and then reuse them without checking them first. Only purchase software programs from the publisher or authorized reseller. Unauthorized copies of programs may contain a virus. Make sure any public bulletin board programs you use ran successfully for someone else before you load them into your computer. Finally, you can install a virus checking program that will test your computer each time you start it or insert a different diskette. Now that we've discussed some of the responsibilities of a computer user, let's take a closer look at the computer equipment itself. Why should you take the time to learn about your computer equipment, or as it's often called, computer hardware? Simply because you can't be computer literate without a basic understanding of the hardware. Buzzwords like RAM, motherboard, page printer, CD-ROM, disk drive, modem, mouse, and many more are used in conversations both at work and at home. In fact, it's hard to join in the conversation unless you have a basic understanding of computer hardware. And it's hard to make good buying decisions without a solid understanding of what you're buying. All the advertising you see looks great and promises terrific results, but there are so many brands and types of equipment to choose from. If you're not knowledgeable, it's hard to choose the equipment that will meet your needs today and tomorrow.
Simply defined, hardware refers to all the equipment that makes up a computer system. It's the electronic components, circuit boards, and peripheral equipment that you can touch. Another term you often hear is software. Software refers to programs that tell the hardware what to do. Hardware and software must work together for a computer to operate. To help you understand how hardware and software work together, think of an audio tape player as hardware, a piece of equipment. The music on the audio tape is the software. To listen to the music, you must use the hardware and software together. Computer hardware and software work together in a similar way. Information in a computer flows through input, processing, output, and storage. Computer hardware is used for each of these operations. The hardware that processes the information you input to the computer is called the processor, or central processing unit. The hardware that's used to bring information in and out of the computer is called a device. An input device, like a keyboard, is used to input information to the computer. Conversely, an output device, like a printer, is used to display the output of the computer. There are also devices that can both input and output information. Most of these devices are used for communication and for storage. Examples are a modem and a disk drive. Let's look first at the input devices. There are three main ways you can input information to a computer. These ways correspond to senses people use to take in information. Computers can input information using devices activated by touch. They can also take in visual information. And they can even input sound information. We'll start with devices you touch to input information. The two most commonly used devices are the computer keyboard and the mouse. Normally, you'll use the keyboard to give information and commands to the computer. However, the mouse is becoming standard on many personal computer systems. Personal computer keyboards contain alphabetic, punctuation, numeric, symbol, and function keys. You'll also find cursor movement keys. The cursor is the flashing bar or vertical line on your computer monitor that shows where the information you type will appear. When you press an arrow key, it moves your cursor one line space or one character space in the direction the arrow is pointing. You can use the delete key, labeled delete or DEL, to delete information positioned over the cursor. The enter key, labeled return on some keyboards, enters the text or command you just typed. A computer keyboard has function keys marked with a letter F and a number for inputting commands to the computer. On our keyboard, 12 function keys appear along the top of the keyboard. Other keyboards have the function keys arranged on the left-hand side. They still perform the same operations, depending on the software program you're using. Handy templates provided with the software programs you purchase give you a quick reference for various key combinations. As we mentioned, the mouse is the other most commonly used input device that's controlled by touch. Most mice have a left button and a right button. Usually, you'll tap the left button to select an item on the screen. If you hold down the left mouse button, you can select a group of items. You can also double-click on the left mouse button to perform various operations. Each type of action performed with the mouse gives the computer a different command. As you learn how to use a software program, you'll learn how to use the mouse with the software to accomplish tasks as efficiently as possible. A scanner is a type of input device that enters information visually. It allows you to store visual information in the computer. Graphic artists and desktop publishers use image scanners to read in art and photographs and change them into images that can be read by the computer. Those images stored in the computer can be combined with text to enhance newsletters and brochures. A page scanner lets you place the image to be scanned inside the scanner, close the lid and start scanning. A handheld scanner is rolled down or across the art or photograph to capture the image. Another type of scanner reads barcodes. These codes consist of small bars of different widths that stand for price, date, size, and so on. A barcode reader, also called an optical character recognition scanner, deciphers these codes and inputs the information into a computer. We've now finished part one of computer literacy. We've explained what a computer is, how a computer works, how today's computers evolved, what important developments are occurring in work, education, and home computer use, what responsibilities you have as a computer user, 
What we mean by computer hardware, what we mean by software, what the computer processor is, and the kinds of input devices you may use. With this information, you now have a useful understanding of computers and what they can do. You've learned basic hardware terminology and learned how hardware and software work together. You've also been introduced to many kinds of input devices. In part two of this course, we'll discuss more hardware components, including the computer processor and output devices. We'll talk about storage devices and the many kinds of software available to help with a wide range of tasks. Part two will increase your computer literacy even further.